Hello, heroes and Zargons. I'm Alfred, and this is The Trials and Tribulations of Zargon, a series which details the many ways in which the Emperor's heroes foil Zargon and his minions in their plots to conquer the Empire. In it, we'll review published quests and any house rules or modifications I'm using to make the game more interesting and challenging. This fifth of my house rules videos covers the level advancement deck for the Dwarf. For info on why I designed level advancement decks and how they work, see House Rules 2, linked below. I'll share part of that video here to let my former self quickly recap the process for gaining a level. Each class has a deck of 10 improvement cards. When a hero completes three quests, and again every three quests thereafter, the hero can seek training. Training costs 500 gold coins per level, and each subsequent level costs an additional 100 gold coins. So. For example, a hero with no levels must complete three quests and then pay 500 gold coins to draw from the leveling deck. If a hero has already drawn from that deck once, they must complete an additional three quests before they draw again. Now that you know how the system works, let's talk about the dwarf. The dwarf occupies some nebulous space in the game, obviously a front-ranked fighter that needed some differentiation from the barbarian. That differentiation came in the form of nominal stat differences and a very obvious utility bonus the dwarf's ability to disarm traps. This combat slash utility role fits the general flavor for dwarves from traditional role-playing games and provided a pretty useful font of inspiration for my dwarf advancement deck. Given the dwarven reputation for toughness, I shaded the combat skills more defensively to create a clearer distinction between this character and the barbarian. Then I looked to provide a couple more utility levels than I provided for other characters. First, the raw stat array. As a reminder, I consider raw stats to be body points, mind points, movement dice, attack dice, and defend dice. Dwarves are traditionally d tougher than other species, so the obvious solution was to provide an additional defend die. However, the hero's equipment already grants their defense a substantial advantage over their offense, so I looked in a slightly different direction to show off the dwarf's resilience. The dwarf gets a very basic stat array of plus two body points and plus one mind points. This keeps him a little ahead of the Barbarian in mind point count and allows the body point gap to widen slightly between the Dwarf and the Barbarian. The fully advanced Dwarf has 9 body points and 4 mind points. To improve combat function, I gave the Dwarf 4 abilities. The first of these, called Turtle, covers the increased defensive capability. It reads, Announce that you are turtling at the end of your turn. Until the start of your next turn, when you defend, all shields count as successes. You may use this ability a number of times equal to your mind points per dungeon. This ability gives the dwarf the option to increase defensive capabilities relative to current equipment loadout. A dwarf with starting equipment rolls an average of 0.66 shields normally and one shield when turtling, while a dwarf with six defend dice rolls an average of 1.98 shields normally and three shields when turtling. So, assuming three uses per dungeon, an average starting dwarf will save about one body point per dungeon while a fully armored dwarf will save three. Of course, the beauty of skills is that, well used, they can potentially be much stronger. If, say, a turtling dwarf can absorb three attacks, well, now we're talking. The second defensive skill for the dwarf was the last added and is nominally useful out of combat as well as in. Spell resistance reads, Your natural dwarven stubbornness sometimes prevents spells from working against you. Whenever a spell is cast on you, roll a d6. On a 6, the spell is dispelled. This spell may also be dispelled by any means specified on the card itself. That last clause may be unnecessary, but I wanted to be sure that my heroes knew that this was not a replacement effect. If they got to roll d6 for each of their mind points to negate the spell, they still got to do that, and they got an extra d6 to boot. I designed this skill before the rise of the Dread Moon, but it got a big boost in usefulness with the new monsters. The idea is ripped right out of the Warhammer world, where the last version of Warhammer Fantasy Battles I played had this ability as a core trait for every dwarf. Since this game was nominally set in the Warhammer universe, I figured it was a great place to go for inspiration. We have since house ruled that magical effects outside of combat can be negated on the dwarf by this ability as well, so things like roving magical traps that drain body points can be resisted as well, for example. I tried to continue the defensive theme with the dwarf's attack skills as well. The first of these, Advance, gives the hero some positioning options. It reads, when you roll an attack, you may push the monster away from you a number of squares equal to the number of skulls rolled. Monster defense is irrelevant to the push. You may use this ability a number of times equal to your mind points per dungeon and must declare that you are using the ability when making the attack. 
I figure this ability is useful in lots of situations for clearing paths for hero movement, pinning monsters in rooms, opening up lines of sight, and generally ensuring that the heroes fight who they want, when they want. The final combat ability gives the dwarf some ability to clear out those pesky high defense dice monsters who soak up rounds of attention and sometimes drag the pace of the game down. It is also right in the flavor of the Warhammer universe. Bear a Grudge reads, when a monster damages you, you may declare that you are holding a grudge against that monster. You roll an additional two attack dice against any creature you hold a grudge against. You may use this ability a number of times equal to your mind points per dungeon. This ability was built with ogres and wolves in mind, but it gets a lot better in the Dread Moon as well, where it can be paired with a low-quality artifact to allow the dwarf to pack a serious punch against ethereal beings. These seven cards left me with three additional slots intended to be utility, though as you'll see, two of them improve function when monsters are around, and in this sense might be considered combat abilities as well. First, I knew that I wanted to build on the Dwarven Trap ability, so I gave them Keen Eyes, which states, Your Dwarven observation allows you to spot traps through doorways and when monsters are present. If you are adjacent to a door, you may use your action to search for traps. You may search for traps even if a monster is in your line of sight. This ability gives the heroes two ways to deal with unknown traps in rooms and two different costs for doing so. The dwarf can spend a turn looking for them, blocking the prime fighting real estate of the doorway while doing so, or the barbarian can walk in, taking damage and continuing to move. This ability pairs strongly with diligence, which states, you may take two actions in your turn, but you may not take the same action twice. You may use this ability a number of times equal to your mind points per dungeon. This ability pairs best with keen eyes, but also has some functionality with spell scrolls and other action using items. It can also help a dwarf clear a room quickly for traps, doors, and treasure via our house rules that let heroes search for both traps and doors with one action. In most core quests, that's not a concern, but our house rules sometimes put a lot of monsters on the board at a time, so you may want to move quickly. The dwarf's final card, Eye for Treasure, is the crown jewel of the deck. It reads, when drawing from the treasure deck, draw two cards. Choose the one that you will be affected by. I suspect that this card is too good, but it is really fun. It fuels hero growth by increasing rewards, drastically improving the heroic ability to stock up on healing potions, and will be the subject of its own video in the future. Probably if you're playing with multiple people, this card ought to be used in conjunction with an agreement to share found treasure. Otherwise, there's a lot of potential for the dwarf to pull ahead in loot. So... Should your hero get there, the final form of the dwarf is a treasure-generating defensive machine that can help other heroes develop a strategy by getting the lay of the battlefield and then dish out punishment by hitting the hardest enemies. When I first designed the dwarf's abilities, they felt pedestrian, but now that I've played with them for a while, I'm much more excited about them. I'd love to plot together about dwarven advancement in the comments below.